Revelation chapter number 3. Book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, chapter is number 3. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, and unto, the, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. That the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door, I will come into him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and set down the throne of with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Bow your heads for a moment. Lord, we're thankful now for the Word of God, for the Spirit of God, Lord, is able to give the message this morning. And I pray, Lord, you would put the right thoughts and words in my mouth. And I pray, Lord, you'd give the anointing that is impossible to produce. Lord, it's got to be there. It's got to be from you. Lord, I pray there would be an accomplishment in the lives of your people because of the preaching of the Word of God this morning. I ask the Lord to wash me clean. God, that I'd be a vessel sanctified and meet for your use this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter number 3, last church in the Bible before the rapture. Picture of it anyhow. In Revelation chapter 3, or 2 and 3, 7 churches. Number 7, church at Laodicea. Chapter 4 and verse number 1. Look at near the end of the verse there. The Bible says, Come up hither, and I'll see hereafter. A picture of the rapture. Last church before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, wow, what an opportunity to live in a time like that, an age like that, a period of time like that. It is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for you and I to be uh, very unique and very distinct in an age that is distinct for its lukewarmness, is distinct for its rebellion, is distinct for its form of godliness, no power, uh, is distinct for its general rejection of a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in an age and time like that, you say, man, what a wipeout. An age and time like that, you and I have a chance to be not a wipeout, not a washout, but a standout. Now, you know, you and I have been bombarded all week by the media, and, and they've been telling you about, you know, this guy and that guy, and somebody else is going to be the star, and somebody's going to get the most uh, valuable player today, and, and they toss around names like Lloyd and Slash and Emmett and Troy and Irvin, Irwin, Irvin, whatever his name is. They toss your names like that out and, and you know they say that guy he's gonna be the he's gonna be the player, he'll be the MVP, man, he'll be the guy, he'll be the guy of the day. That might be good for those guys, but for you and I, you want to be a standout as well. And the picture is you're living in an age when there aren't any. You're living in an age in which it's a wipeout. You look at an age in which it's a disaster. It's a washout. It's that kind of a thing. And in an age like that, you certainly you ought to be one that stands out very, very easily. In Daniel chapter 3, you had the three Hebrew children there. And uh, in that day and time, you had the big old image there. And they were to bow down to the image of gold. And it was a big one. It was 90 feet high. And it was a humongous image of gold set up in the plains of Dura, in the land of Shinar there. And uh, anyhow, uh, in that land there, they were told to bow to that image, bow to that idol. And everybody bowed. I mean, the sheriffs, they bowed. The treasurers, they bowed. The counselors, they bowed. Everybody was bowing down. And if you can imagine everybody bowing down and somebody doesn't, you know, like a sore thumb, man, that baby sticks out like a sore thumb. So here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they stick out like a sore thumb. They would not bow. And Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and his fury, picture the Antichrist, in his rage and his fury, he says, get him in here. And he begins to talk to him and said, if you don't bow down to that image, uh, then you're going to be cast in the midst of burning fiery furnace. And uh, they said very calmly, King, we're not careful to answer thee. Ho-hum, you're not telling us anything we... 
don't know about, we're not really worried about, all that worried about it. Our God's able to deliver us, and if He delivers us, that's fine and dandy. If He doesn't deliver us, uh, we'll take the consequences. It's all up to, the, up to the Lord, not up to you. And I'm sure that really didn't, you know, turn him on other than trigger him. Uh, but uh, that's how they felt. And those, uh, they definitely stood out. There's no doubt about the fact they stood out. And, you know, everybody wants to stand. You want to be a standout. What you do and uh, where you go, you want to be known. You want to be a standout. And most people do. Well, I think that you ought to have desires that way and motives that way for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that you and I, if anybody could be a standout, if anybody lives in an age in which it's easy to be a shining star or be a standout, it's you and I live in the Laodicean church age. And the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 3, uh, you're looking at a period of time that God really doesn't care that much about. Because here's a, here's a period of time which the people have slipped very, very badly. And I say to you, first of all, if you want to be a standout, you're going to have to revert back to the old-fashioned ways. Now the old-fashioned ways are found in the church, and the church before this in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7 and verse number 8. Uh, God set an open door before this church in Philadelphia, a city of brotherly love, uh, church in Philadelphia. And the Bible says there's an open door there, and no man's going to shut that door, and shut it, no man opens it. And he says, I know thy works. And he says, uh, there's something unique about you people here at Philadelphia. He says, thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And uh, if you and I were going to be a shining star and stick out, then you and I, uh, he says, I would, you were, you know, you were not lukewarm, then you and I are going to have to revert back from a lukewarm age, an apostate age, and you and I are going to have to go back to the period before when the Word of God meant a whole lot. You know, back in the old days, the word, as a matter of fact, look at verse number 10. It says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them to dwell upon the earth. If you and I are going to be a standout, then one thing for sure, you and I, we're going to have to go back to the old-fashioned way, and the old-time religion, and the old book. You take in Revelation chapter 3, the only church out of the bunch there that's not told to repent. Everybody else, I mean, Smyrna, Thyatira, Sardis, uh, Pergamos, they're told to repent. Uh, even Ephesus, I mean, uh, you know, you've got some good things going for you. You know, you labeled, you have not painted, but it says you've left your first love. Repent and return to your first love. And the church of Philadelphia, he doesn't even tell them to repent. Then apparently, if you're going to be a standout, you got to go back the other way. You don't have people always wanting to live in the past. I'd like to live in the past. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't mind going back about 20 years. Hey, I wouldn't mind going back. Well, you know, like they say, knowing then what I know now. <laughs> I wouldn't mind going back uh, physically. You know, that wouldn't be bad. Going back, I'd go back. Hey, put me way back. <laughs> I'd like to go back. Let's go, man, you know. <laughs> I mean, when you just go and go and go and go some more, I wouldn't mind going back to those days when the energy was just endless. You thought, man, I just, you know, I'd never run out and uh, that'd be all right. And people always, they're trying to live in the past. A friend of mine told me, says, don't, don't ever look back. Don't look back. Don't look back at anything. He said, it'll get you bitter. And he's real good about it. He had a major tragedy in his family just a year ago. Two years ago. And it was major. I mean, the real thing. Lost his son. And he's been able to look on, been able to look forward, been able to do that. And that's, you know, not everybody can do that, but he's, I guess he knows wherever he speaks. But you and I, when it comes to spiritually now, you and I, we've got to go back and say, man, what are we doing here? Something's going bad. Something's wrong. Things haven't gotten any better. They've gotten worse. He's telling us to repent. What have we done? We've departed from the Word of God. We've departed from the living Word of the living God. We've departed from the book that God has always used and the style that God used back in those days. The style the old-fashioned preaching was, I mean, fire it up. And nowadays, I mean, they got, they got the vocab. They got everything. got everything but the fire. Back in the old days, it was a bunch of hellfire and damnation preaching. It was the Word of God. I mean, pile it on. Dump it out. I mean, just go for all your worth. I mean, just just go. I mean, go insane if you got to go insane. I mean, pile the thing on. Preach the Word of God. And God did something with it. Say, well, that's crazy. Uh, well, I won't say it's crazy, but it's foolish. It's what the Bible calls the foolishness of preaching. And God just chose what everybody said. That's crazy, man. Why is that guy raising his voice at me? He don't have to raise his voice at me. I can hear. He's got a microphone. He don't have to do that at all. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But you know what God does? God just uses the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
and that is preaching the cross. The Bible says, Unto them perish is foolishness, but unto us, which, unto us which believe, it is the power of God. And you and I, we need to realize that, brother, we can't go for what's out there now. We can't be playing games about this thing. It's the old-fashioned way that God has used. And you and I need to realize that, brother, God says, ain't nobody going to close the door on you. Fire it away. I mean, crank it up and fire it away and uh, go for it, but stick with the old-fashioned religion and stick with the old-time way and it'll be a plus for you. The church at Laodicea. And, you know, uh, I'll just put it this way. If you and I, we'd go back 50 years, that'd be about it for me. A little over 50 years. First time I ever heard of the hellfire and damnation preaching was at uh, uh, a joint, an area, a neighborhood, Lenten service at Crystal Park Methodist Church. And down at Crystal Park Methodist Church, all I can remember about, there was an old white-haired preacher there, and he preached it away, and he preached on the judgment. I remember God squeezing on my little old young heart uh, back in those days. I didn't know what to do. Some people went to the altar. We never had an altar called church I went to, and never even knew what it was all about. I didn't know what to do, but I remember God actually squeezed on my heart under the old-fashioned preaching of the Word of God. And you know, the old-fashioned preaching of the Word of God is always going to be a plus to you. Uh, you'll not lose there. And you know, there's some areas in which it do you well to go back. And this area here, the age in which you and I live, if we just go back to the Word of God and just keep the Word of God, you would not go wrong by keeping the Word of God. You don't go wrong there. Uh, I look back and I... I think a visit I made this week and I went out to the Pines Nursing Home. Mrs. Sumney's out there. Myrtle Sumney. And Miss Sumney, she's out there. And, and every time I see her, I get a real blessing. She's very pleasant. She's, a, she's just a real, real blessing. Delma's mother. And I stopped to see her and, and uh, we just had an enjoyable time there. But every time I go, she, she goes all the way back to her childhood days in North Carolina. And she began to tell me, uh, she told me, the last time I saw her, she said uh, they had an organ in their house. And uh, Daddy told her she could play the organ as long as she wanted to play the organ. She just couldn't play any of this jazzy type music. <laughs> she had to play church music. And, uh, and then she was telling me the other time I saw her yesterday or a couple days ago when I saw her, she says that, uh, she says, yeah, I remember Daddy. said so Daddy was, uh, he was a superintendent at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And uh, she says, uh, Daddy used to take his Bible every night and sit in front of the fireplace. And us youngins, there were three boys and two girls. And uh, he'd set us around kind of like an arch. And he'd set us around, he'd sit in front of the fireplace there and get the Bible out. And he'd read the Bible to us. And we got old enough, he says, and we took turns. And everybody had to read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. You know what she is? She's 88, 89, going on 89 years of age. And her mind is kind of confused. But you know what she's drawn on? You know why the, everybody out there says, Oh man, they just love her to pieces. She, she's just a blessing out there. She is a, go out and visit her. She'll be a blessing to you. You know what she's drawn on? She's drawn on the old fashioned way. She's drawn on the old time religion. She's drawn on the word of God that was given to her when she's just a child, uh, clear back many, many years ago. I said, Miss Sunday before I leave, I like to read a little bit, bit of the word of God to you. And uh, this is the passage, that, this is what Jesus said, it's John chapter 14. And I said, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are, and that's all she wrote. I mean, I was done right there. I mean, she picked that thing up, our many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to prepare a place. You know what she's drawn on? She's drawn on the Word of God from way back yonder as a little child in North Carolina. Her daddy gave her the Word of God. Her daddy exposed her to the Word of God. Preacher exposed her to the Word of God. And now she's living on it and making it. You know what it's going to take for you and I? It's going to take the same thing. And if you want to be a standout in an age that, an age that generally speaking is a wipeout, it's going to take the old-fashioned book. 1611 authorized version. It's going to take the old-fashioned way. Hellfire and damnation and preaching. It's going to take uh, the old-fashioned uh, old-time religion of just taking your children and setting them down before the Word of God, giving them the Word of God, and that'll be a plus to them right on through. Uh, here is an age that's a wipeout. And today you are one of the age as such, or you are... The other side of the coin, a stand out for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, the, the, what can I say? The choice is yours. And I'll just simply say that, uh, you won't hardly be, you can't hardly beat the old fashioned way. Now, as far as, uh, that goes, uh, I look at Laodicea there and I say, I don't want to be part of that. Uh, outfit there. I may live in that period of time, but I want to be at least a, a cut above, uh, really about four or five cuts above, but at least a cut above that age there. And I look at another uh, verse there, in verse number 17, I'm looking at a, a period of time in which you're dealing with a bunch of cake eaters. 
That's right. They've got it all. They've got it all given to them. They've got it all on a silver platter. They've been offered, the, looks like they got the moon on it, a silver platter. Looks like they're born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Just about. If you want to be a standout, and who doesn't? If you want to be a stand, and God wants you to, not a wipeout. If God wants you to, then you're going to have to realize that opposition is not a curse. Look at verse number 18. He says, I'm telling you, buy of me. I'm telling you, gold tried in the fire. And he says, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy sad that thou mayest fear. It's as though you just had it too soft too long. And we have. You know what you and I have done? You and I have rode in on. You and I have rode in on. The price that others have paid. For a lot of years. And made it a little too easy for us. Adoniram Judson. He was over in Burma there. and All the difficulties that he faced. And rode the ship out. And six years before he had a convert. And. His wife died in the field there, Ann Hasseltine Judson. She died over there. and uh, There was uh, difficulties on top of difficulties. And uh, his ministry, you and I, said, well, that fellow, I mean, he's outstanding. Well, he's outstanding. But you know what he's able to do? He's able to, he's able to go through the fire. He's able to handle opposition to the adversary. And he's able to continue on. And believe me, there were adversaries over there. You read about those Orientals, those Asians over there. And, uh, you take C.T. Studd. I mean, it was just what those guys went through. You and I cannot hardly even imagine the thing those guys went through. But you know, you can take opposition the first time it comes your way. And you say, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to take that. I'm out of here. Or you can take opposition and say, that's all right. We'll handle it. That's no problem. Everybody has uh, little difficulties in their life. No biggie. We'll keep it for what it is. And we'll go beyond it and go on. But you know how somebody is too soft first time things doesn't go well. They feel like, oh man, this is terrible. This is a curse. Maybe it's not a curse. Maybe it's a blessing. Maybe God's just going to take and move you up a, another level. Maybe God's going to make it a blessing to you. Cause it to prove to be a blessing. Here's what David said. David said, before I, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I've kept thy testimonies. You know how sometimes uh, people have difficulty in their life and all of a sudden the Word of God does seem like it's got some importance to them. But before you have any difficulty, it's as though, um, we'll get to it someday. We'll get around to it sometime. Once you have some difficulty, you realize, that, brother, I live and die by the Word of God. And uh, it's the Word of God, brother. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you realize that you live and die by the Word of God. You realize how important it really is. How important it really is. And I want to say, if you want to be a standout, then uh, you need to be able to look at opposition as not a curse, but as though an opportunity to... Prove yourself to others, to the Lord, and to yourself. And you know the old story, the old adage is that the cream rises to the top, and certainly it does. And the opposition, of course, it's to be expected for every Christian. The Bible says about the Antichrist, and he's just a, a picture of the devil. He's a devil incarnate, like Jesus was God incarnate, devil in a body. Uh, but uh, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, then if you're doing something right, expect opposition. Yes. Why wouldn't you expect it? I mean, you think everything's always going to be smooth sailing? No, there are going to be some breakers out there. There are going to be some high waves out there. There are going to be some foam out there. I mean, they come smashing through. You count on it. The Bible says he's he going to oppose you. You try and do right? He's going to, you're going to have to battle your way to do right. And uh, you can either say, well, what am I doing wrong? Oh, what I, uh, or, you know, you can say, I'll handle it. I'll take it. It's to be expected. Bob Jones Sr. said, the door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. And you have an opportunity not to be like the age in which we live, but not to be so soft that you can't handle any little 
problem. But rather, if you are put through the fire, I mean put through the fire, it's not like as though, man, I'm going to fall apart, I'm going to crumble. It's as though I will rally, I will rise to the top, I will overcome it, I'm going to get the victory over it. You want to be a standout. I want you to be a standout. God wants you to be a standout. And you need to realize that uh, it's going to, you're going to have to overcome some opposition from time to time. That just goes part uh, goes with it. It's part of it. And it is not a curse. Don't forget who your adversary is. The Bible says, Your adversary, the roaring lion, the devil is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour you. And the first time you have uh, an adversary and he shows his ugly colors to you, don't fizzle, fade, and become a watchout. But become a standout for the Lord. Down in Mexico sits Welton Jones, and they're fixing to have dedication of a building about twice the size of this. Brother Welton Jones came through here back in the 80s, probably about 83, 5, 7, somewhere in that range. Uh, Brother Welton Jones came through here. When he came through here, that church was being started in Miraville in a garage with one door on it. And people started going. There's something about Brother Weldon Jones and his preaching. It, it, uh, it'll be a blessing. Uh, no doubt. Uh, they, they started going and began to be upsetting to the adversary. And the adversary instructed some people to burn them down. Now, not like us. Door, door, door. door went, I mean, walk out the window. <laughs> you know, what's the difference? They don't even need doors around here. But they didn't have it. They had a garage with one door on. And the adversary instructed people to light a fire right there at that door. They couldn't get up. Burn them down. Did Weldon Jones run? Weldon Jones felt like as though God must be getting ready to do something. Because the devil has certainly shown himself. And today they're fixing to have dedication on a building. They'll see not 200 like this. 400. Down in Mexico, Miraville, I don't know, that doesn't sound like Mexico, Mexico City to me. It sounds like some little, you know, Miraville, Louisville, it sounds like small town, but God's done something. And if you want to be a standout, then you'll have to be able to handle opposition. You take today, uh, those guys, I'm sure, they ain't nobody going to be laying down. I mean, those guys, are they'll be ready to tear each other's heads off. But, you know, that doesn't stop anybody on either one of those teams from going into the game or the battle for all they're worth. For example, I said you might hear the name Aikman. Very likely you can hear that name as MVP. And uh, he may be the stand-up. Maybe he won't be, but he'll probably be one of them. And uh, Aikman is so competitive that that fellow, when he gets miffed and things don't go his way, it's like his own opposition. He, he wants to devastate the opposition. And if things don't go his way... They said he can get so aggravated that he can actually kick a football. They seen him kick a football 100 yards. Kick a football 100 yards. I'll just simply say, if it's 75 yards, he must have had quite a tailwind. <laughs> or else he had adrenaline flowing like you wouldn't believe. And I know all you ladies sitting there looking at me like, what is this all about? That just means somebody has just opposition, I mean, that doesn't phase them at all. That out of them, and you just can't hardly stop them. You know how it'll be for you and I? I'll be the same way. I mean, if you have opposition, that shouldn't make you, you know, turn your tail under like the white-tailed deer, you know, when uh, they've been shot and wounded, and that tail just drops down between their legs, and uh-uh. That thing ought to make that flag go up, brother. And you think, man, that guy's got to be a trophy, man. That, that flag is two feet high. That ought to bring the third best out of you. And ought to cause you to charge and make you want to go. Now, everybody faces opposition. Do you know what I said to you? The old-fashioned, old-time Methodist preacher said, the door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. And you'll find out about it somewhere, sometime. Like anybody else. And you don't quit. You rise. You stay in the battle. You go stronger. You go for all your word. Don't even think of bowing out of the race. A standout. My question is, what are you?
one of the bunch. I would want to be one of the bunch in this age. But you are, or you stick out like a sore thumb. But boy, what a blessing in the eyes of God. Wouldn't it be something if the Lord, you know, He's kind of scouted around? The Lord does that. You say, well, in all His eyes, the pure of eyes, and behold, iniquity. He never looks on iniquity with favor. But He sees it all. You know that, and I know that. But it'd be like the time, you know, the Lord, He was, uh, he was looking down around here in the, or in the Chaldees, and He was looking for somebody to be the father of a nation. A nation that He set standards for, and unconditionally said, I'll bless him that blesseth thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And these shall all families of the earth, nations of the earth, be blessed. That hasn't changed. God's blessings upon you in accordance to your feelings towards uh, the nation of Israel. That has not changed. You say, well, man, I'd sure like to be father of that nation. Well, you know, God, He's taking a look around and down there in the earth of the Chaldees, between the Tigris and the Euphrates there, and, and that territory in between, and all the way down there in the bottom, as I recall that map there, the Bible says he, he found us Abraham. Oh, he found Abraham. Well, Abraham. Oh, what about him? What, uh, what kind of stock did he come What was Abraham? He was just a man, the Bible says, he found his heart faithful before God. Let me ask you this. I mean, what if God looked around town, scouted around town, what would he find? Would he find somebody that's going to be faithful? What would he do? You want to be a standout? Sure you do. God wants you to be? Sure he does. You don't want to be part of the age? All right, then you're going to have to handle opposition and not consider it the end of the world and as a curse like this soft age does. Now, I nobody has any grit anymore. Nobody has any standards. They're all trying to get in one melting pot. You have preacher after preacher. They're afraid to tag the church. I've been asking one fellow. I said, well, what church you go to? Oh, about 40 miles away. I said, uh, next time I see him, well, well, what about your church? Oh, well, we, uh, about four or five of us. Finally, the other day, I says, well, what is that church? Man, I church? And he says, no, we're just, uh, we don't have any tag. We're just, uh, want to be known as Christians. Don't have any tag. You know what I am? Look on the outside out there. I'm not ashamed of it. That's what I am. By the grace of God, I'm a Bible believer. And by the grace of God, I'm a Bible believing Baptist. And I'm not ashamed of it. But you know the day and age in which you live, you, they're nobody, man. I mean, they just, they're just uh, they're kind of a melting pot. And they, because they can't handle any opposition, they just kind of go with the flow. Whatever. You're looking at it. Same as can be, man. They're as soft as mush. And he said, you need, people need some grit to you. And you need some trials to give it to you. And it'll be a blessing to you, not a curse. If you want to be a standout for the Lord, then there's another thing that you're going to have to consider there. And in verse number 20, uh, it's the open door. Not only is it opposition, the old-fashioned way, but it's the open door in verse number 20. And in an age in which the Lord's having a hard time accomplishing much, He's sort of switching off from the gang, group, to the individual. So I'll tell you what, there's not a whole lot going on, but uh, maybe I'll find a few individuals out there that I can really fellowship with. I can open the door for them. Brother, I'll tell you what, you could drive a Mack truck through that thing. I'll open the door. And he said, I stand at the door, knock. If any man open the door, open. Hear my voice and open the door. I will come in him and he will sup with me. Sup with him. I will sup with him and he with me. And you look, see what you're looking at there? It's now moving down to one-on-one -on -one situation say so, well that's alright with me it's alright with me too I can't help what you do but I can help what I do and in a one on one situation you have a Lord you know it's as though he's looking for some fellowship he's looking for some sweet fellowship 
And he says, I stand at the door, knock. The other night went to Rick's house and Shirley you knocks know, on the door. Rick said, who's there? He said, it's us. Not sure he knows, you know. And, who's there? You know, and, and well, it's us. And, and he said, I want to know who's there. I said, it's the preacher, Brother Art. Oh, come on in. You know. And we got the royal welcome after the third try. You know. And uh, that's sort of uh, maybe how it is with you. Maybe it's third try, you know, where the Lord wants in. It's me, Jesus. Been missing some fellowship with you. Haven't been a lot going on lately. Sure like to fellowship with you. We'd have some sweet fellowship. Boy, it'd be good. Man, would it be sweet. Would you let me in? I'd like to fellowship with you. Who is it? I don't believe that. That's wrong number. Call somebody out. I mean, I don't believe it at all. That's a joke. Uh, who's there? It's me, Jesus. It's no joke. I can't do anything as far as the church's man. They're, they're just, I mean, lukewarm. They don't really care about much of anything. They just all they want is just kind of a cakewalk on in. And I'd really like to find somebody I can really fellowship with. And would you please let me in? Open the door. Please, I'm not going to kick the door down. And I sure wish you'd open the door. One time I was down Lawrence Road, and this is back years ago. And I was looking for a guy. And he used to come around, and when he was on top, he was pretty good. He stayed on top one time for maybe six months to a year. When he was on the bottom, he'd go all the way to the bottom. I mean, to the bottom. And I hadn't seen him for a while, and the report wasn't too good. And I thought, man, I've got to locate this guy. I knew where he was supposed to be staying. So I went down there, and he was at the bottom. I pulled him this way, and he come in off one of those side streets and came in this way. And he got out, and he didn't even know who I was. He got out, and I mean, this guy was so furious and so, I mean, just so high on something that, I mean, he didn't, he didn't even know uh, what was going on. And I spoke to him, and he said, Art, I'll kill her. I'll kill her. He went up to the door, and he went like, Gah! and he kicked that door, and that door was like as made out of matchbox, matchsticks. That door just went everywhere. He went out on in there, and fortunately, she was not there. Because that guy was, I mean, beside himself. You know, the Lord's not going to do that. The Lord's not going to go up and blam! I mean, just kick the door in and say, I told you, it's me. I want in. I'm not going to do that. I said, if any man open the door, I'll knock. Any man. Every man in this building. Everyone. You got the ladies outnumbered. Well, they're all in the nursery. <laughs> With those young ones, you know. They're rocking them babies. Uh, but uh, any man, I don't care who it is. If you will open that door, he said, I will come in and sup with you, sup with him, and he with me. Now, I want to ask you this. Have you ever had some real sweet fellowship with the Lord? Close, sweet fellowship where you could sense the presence of the Lord. There was a tenderness there. Cleanness there. A peace there beyond words. Man, I love it. I do too. And you know what? It's like that's what you want. And you're never satisfied with just a little fellowship. And saying, well, I'm not condemned. I got a peace. That's all right. You do. You make peace with God. You've got that. But there's still something about that still small voice. There's still something about that peace that passeth understanding. I don't know how to put it in words. I don't know how to describe it. All I can say is that it's something that you long for. More of it. All the time. You can't manufacture it. 
It has to do with the result of a burden made for others. It has to do with keeping the world at bay and keeping the Word of God saturated in your heart. It has to do with like the songwriter said, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Nothing between. There's something there that's so vivid and so... That's what the Lord promises. That's what the Lord promises. said, I'll knock, but you'll have to open the door. And if you open the door, I'll come in. And I'll give you an opportunity that you never dreamed of. I'll sup with you. I'll sit right down at the table with you. I'll sup with you. You can sup with me. It'll be a blessing. I say to myself, oh, I'll tell you what now. I mean, the age may not have a whole lot going. And evidently, and apparently, and according to the Word of God, it doesn't have much going. But I know what I want to be, man. I don't want to be caught up in the age. If I have a chance for some sweet fellowship with the Lord, I want some sweet fellowship with the Lord, man. I, I, I want that. I don't want to be somebody the Lord's trying, trying, trying to say, Later, Lord. Later. Not now. I'm busy. I'm doing my thing. Later. I don't want that. We've had, well, the Christmas fellowship's been a blessing. Great. Somebody said this year was as good or better than any. In fact, several said that. Ron Emmerich told me, said there was something about the Spirit there. Did you tell me that, brother? It was just great. It was just a great time. You know what that is? That's a foretaste. That's a foretaste of what we can have. With, but a taste. But a taste! That's all. What we can have with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what you'll have to do? You're just going to have to open the door. You know, down there, and I don't know about all this stuff, but I read. And I read where they're trying to create a problem now to upset the cowboys. And they're creating a black-white problem. And they're saying that Aikman, all he does, gets on the black guys. And one of them black linemen said, 90% of us is black. <laughs> so who else are going to get on? You know? But uh, one of those guys took his side and said, he's my friend. He's my friend. If there's any problem, go to him by. And I think it was uh, Monty Irvin. And he said, I'm as black as they can get. I'm as black as it gets. He said, I wear black sunglasses. And a black, well, something else, scarf? I don't know. Something else. And he said, he's my friend. That's just a bunch of junk. He's my friend. You know what you and I could say? I too am as black as it gets. Like Paul said, I'm chief of sinners. I'm as black as it gets. Thank God for the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Instead of being a washout, they're washed out. I'm not black anymore in the eyes of God. He's my friend. I want to sup with him. I want to sup with him. He's my friend. If there's any problem, I'd go to him. I don't have any problem with him. He's my friend. How about you? You going to be a washout? You going to have him washed out by the blood of Jesus Christ? You going to be a standout in the fellowship with the Lord? Doesn't the Bible say if any man love God, same as known of him? Correct? You know where I'm at, don't you? Sure you do. You know exactly where I'm at. It's known. You know whether I got a relationship with the Lord or whether I don't. You know that. Say, so well, how do we know? Well, one of the ways is, put, put it this way. If God asks you to do something, you don't want to do it. Oh, I love God. Oh, no. God asks you to do it, you don't want to do it, you'll do it anyhow. That's easy. Whatever the Lord says, that's fine. 
That's better than my will. That'll be the right way. No. You know whether I have any strings on me or whether I don't, don't you? You know whether I live in the Word of God or whether I don't, don't you? You know whether I'm praying or whether I don't, don't you? All right. Likewise, your life's an open door of the Lord, but how about your heart? Can't do nothing with that bunch. But I think maybe I can find somebody. How about you today? Any man, any man. I don't stipulation. He doesn't even say where you came from. Doesn't say what you drove in. I mean, somebody said they're half our cars, or I don't even I don't even know who drives what. Ron Thorpe said I'd look the car about for Peggy. Well, if he hadn't said that, I'd have never even I would have never known. I would never have known. I don't know, and I don't care. That doesn't even matter. I know one thing. The Lord's looking for some fellowship from you. Sweet fellowship with you. Any man. Can't beat that. And even the fellowship we've had from time to time has been so good. So good. I want more of it. And I want a lot more of it. I don't want to get out of three years. Out. Ha! Got it again. Good fellowship. Lord, man, it's great. I don't want that. And I want it right through to the rapture. What about you? Either or. Any man. Nobody holds a corner on the Lord. Whatever. I look at the passage there and I say to myself, well, uh, the Bible speaks about someone being an overcomer as well. There you go. There you go. There's somebody definitely there to stand out. They have overcome the tendencies of this age. Passiveness. I don't care. What do I care? Nothing's accomplished anyhow. Why go? Ah, so what? Somebody else will go to them. Passiveness of the age. Don't care attitude. You don't want that. Or the air of pride, arrogancy. Are we ever proud? Are we ever arrogant to display our pride? You take somebody that's doing fairly well and it's, they feel like they're, they are their own man. The pride of independence just surfaces everywhere. You see it all the time. I don't want to pick that up. Uh-uh. You know, you read too many times where brother, we're here today and gone tomorrow. And the Bible says in Him we live and move and have our being. It's all the Lord. It's all the Lord. And I like to overcome the tag of the age, the pride of the age. I like to be somebody that God said, don't do it. Ain't going to work. I told you, don't work. Oh, Lord, I, I know it won't work. I don't even think of it, Lord. I don't even want to. No, Lord, I know there's no chance of it working. The Bible says, A rebuke entereth more into a wise man. It goes in. Don't bounce off. It goes in. And a wise man more than a hundred strikes into a fool. That fool is, puts the whip to him. Same thing. Puts the whip to him. Same thing. That will never catch on. I don't ever seem to catch on. I want to be that way. You don't want to be that way. Nor do I. I mean, a little reproach here and reward on the other side. That's the way you want it. But you want to be an overcomer. You want to be like Elijah was told, you're not the only guy out there. You're but one of 7,000. I want to be part of that bunch that has overcome the idolatry of the age won't bow to anybody, has overcome the passiveness of the age, has overcome the pride of the age, I want to be an overcomer. The name Woodson, Corey, you've heard of Woodson, didn't you? Woodson thinks he's going to be the first guy ever to recover from anterior cruciate 
ligament tear in one season. What just simply means his knee's been totally rebuilt. No, but most time they don't come back. They are, they're but a percentage of what they were. And he thinks he's 85% right now and being entered the very first game of the season as though he'll be the first person ever to come back in the same season from such an injury as that. Wise or unwise, probably will be true at least a little bit. But you know what someone like that is? They're an overcomer. They say, I've taken a hit. I've been just about devastated. But I'm going to fight my way back. I'm going to overcome. I'm not going to just bow out. It's too easy. I'll overcome. Now, how about you? In verse number 21, him that overcometh. You want to be an overcomer? Or you want to be overcome? God wants you to be an overcomer. God wants you to be a standout. God wants you to overcome. Last of all, it's not just fashion way, opposition handled, open door, sweet fellowship, overcoming the age and the apostate age in which we live, the passive age. But as well, if you're going to be a standout, you've got to be farsighted. You've got to look to the other side. Should be a thrill to you. Revelation chapter 4 ought to thrill your heart. Rainbow round about the throne. Can you imagine that? You know how rainbows are? They're just kind of a blessing just to look at. You know why that is, don't you? That just is assurance to your heart. Never going to be a flood like there was in Noah's day. We might have a little one, you know, the park might be flooded and it may be up the whole while. Did you see where that water was this time? Yeah, there may be something like that. And, and you know, down in Palmer, there may be up in the street there in Palmer, in Middleport. Uh, but not going to be like it was in Noah's day. It's just assuring, just assures to your heart. Just beautiful, soothing, and assurance. What about the other side, the rainbow round about the throne? Streets of gold. Well, won't that be a sight to behold? That throne, steps to that throne, won't that be something? Those four and twenty elders bowed down before the Lord and crying out, Holy, Holy, won't that be something? The cry of heaven about the holiness of God, won't that be something? The beauty and the thrill of your heart. You know, there's something that you and I have got to keep in mind that ought to move you another step the right direction. And that is the reward over there. The Bible says, speaks about crowns. And the Bible speaks about different times in the Word of God. And, and the Bible says if you're going to be crowned, you've got to strive lawfully. You've got to do it, but you've got to do it God's way. It's got to match the Word of God. If you'll do that, you have opportunity to get a crown and crown, uh, cast that crown at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to get your eyes fixed on the other side. If you want to be a standout for the Lord, you've got to get your eyes heavenward. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. Those fellows today, they, they're looking for the wrap-up and Haley had December 6th operation on his back. He says, I'm going to play. I want number five. Two with the 49ers, two with the Cowboys. I want one more ring. I mean, back surgery, ask Ron, he had it. You're looking at about a month and a half later, coming back and playing NFL football. There's a guy who wants it in the worst sort of way. Terry Bradshaw got four of them. Terry Bradshaw back in the 70s when the Steelers were uh, going every time to turn around and win them. I lost one of them. The thing's up for sale, fifteen grand. Somebody found it, had it redone, fifteen thousand dollars. I thought, man, you think Bradshaw would buy a thing in a heartbeat? Maybe it's been replaced. I don't know. Those guys are they, they want that ring in the worst sort of way. You know what? Just as they desire that, and they will put out the very best they've got, and they will go in injured and take a chance on being permanently damaged for life. 
You and I should desire a crown not for ourselves or not to break the record that nobody else has ever done before, but you and I ought to desire a crown to cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today you're either a standout or a wipeout. Your sins have been washed white or you're a washout. If you're saved, this is an age that's lukewarm. God says, I'll take some fireballs. This is an age of cake eaters. God says, I'll take some cross bearers. This is an age of a form of godliness. God says, I'll take the power. This is an age when the Bible says, who can find a faithful man and find there aren't very many. This is an age when the Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman? Implying they're few and far between, priceless. Proverbs 31. This is an age of rebellion. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. This is an age in which most, the body of Christ, you say, is, they've gone into apostasy and they're wiped out. And it's as though God is looking for somebody that he can have a very, very close relationship with. And I know you want to be a standout. Some are so obsessed with it. Do unusual things. These areas that I have mentioned to you, they'll fit. They'll match. They're biblical. And they can be accomplished by each and every Christian here today. But remember, God gets the glory. God don't want you to be a deadhead or a deadbeat. He wants you to be a standout. He don't want you to live and ho-hum with no motivation. He wants you to Get on to it and get with it and give it your best shot because you're the king's son. I was reading a book this week trying to read a sermon a day. These are little sermonettes. 1757. I think the last one I read was 1786. This fellow, whoever he was, this thinking was certainly superb. He says in one of those little old sermonettes there, he says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Say, well, that, that's Bible. Yeah, right. He said, where misery has surrounded me, mercy hath crowned me. I who knew no righteousness might be made the righteousness of God in him, but I'm a great sinner. And he is a Savior and a great one. Since salvation is rich and by the free grace of God, let God get all the glory. You be a standout, my friend, for the right reason, with the right motive. Don't be a wife out. God don't want you to do that. Don't want you to be a wash out. I want you to be a standout. He said, if I can't do nothing with the age, I'll do it with you personally. If any man, I'll do it with you personally. But you make sure that God gets all the glory out of your life. Bow your heads for prayer. Father, we're thankful now for the Word of God, and we're thankful, Lord, that stirs our hearts, Lord, not to drift into apathy, become complacent and self-satisfied. God, we're thankful that it stirs us aright. I'm sure we're thankful for the promise, Lord, that you said if we will open the door, you'll come in suck. It couldn't be anything sweeter this side of heaven. Help your people to Realize that and desire it and go for it. Overcomers not overcome. Help to open the door. Help to take opposition not as a curse but perhaps a blessing. Help to stand by the old time way. And God, if there's somebody here that's never been saved, may they realize it. Black in skin don't matter, but black in heart does. When they come to Jesus, get the sins forgiven, and get saved eternally. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand and sing now a little bit. Number time? 387. 387, the songbook. Invitation time. God squeezed on your heart this morning. Something you need to pray about specifically. Slip right on down and pray. Maybe it's fellowship. I don't know what it might be. If God spoke in your heart, find your way down here. Don't be too proud. Don't assume the pride of the age. 
find your way down here and do some praying. And again, if you're here without the Lord Jesus Christ, don't go out in rejection of Him. Please don't do it. You'll never be sorry if you receive the Lord as your Savior. I've pulled a lot of blunders in my life, and I'm sure probably you have as well, but there's one thing I did right. In an act of humility, I called upon the Lord Jesus to be my personal Savior. He did what He said He'd do. He'd save a whosoever that called. Have you ever called upon Him and asked Him to be your Savior from sin? It's not a matter of a blanket thing. It's individuals. Salvation's individual. You ever done it? If you haven't done it, why don't you do it? If we sing a little bit this morning. I want to ask you to come. Salvation's a need. Jesus, he'll, he'll meet you. He'll sup with you. He'll save you. He'll sup with you as well. Do it. Just a cold heart. Why don't you come get it warmed up this morning? Pretty general invitation. Maybe there are other needs. We'll call it general. Of course, the number one is salvation. You know that. It's always in a ball game. It's first base, then second. It's not, you know, going to run straight second base. No, you get saved first. Now, if you have a need that way, I want to ask you to get saved today. And if your heart's run cold on God, I want to ask you to determine right now and tell the Lord, say, Lord, I'm going to fix my heart. I don't want to run cold. I don't want to be like the age. I don't want to be a stand out with the right motive and God getting the glory. I need to come. I want to ask you to come as we sing. Not to join the church. Cover the need you have in your heart. There's a stranger at the invitation is not for me. The invitation is for you just to respond to what you heard this morning. You heard what God put in my heart. My burden, you got it. It's gone. You got it. God wants you to do something with it. You do something with it. You respond. A little more singing now. A little more time for you. You come as we sing another verse. Do what God wants you to do. Open now to Him your heart. Do it. Can you remember what I told you, according to the Word of God, to stand out as somebody that reverts back to the old-fashioned way, the sorry age, to stand out as somebody who can handle opposition and don't ruin everything, say, I'll rise above it, I'll handle it, and I'll rise above it. It's somebody who opens the door of their heart to the Lord individually, it doesn't matter what the rest does, they'll do it individually. It's somebody who's determined to be classified as an overcomer and on the other side to have the reward to give to Jesus Christ. That'll do it. It's that basic. One more call, one more chance, one more opportunity. Step out and come if God's spoken to your heart. Hear you now this loving voice. Can't do it for you.
Lord, we're thankful again now for the book, and we're thankful, Lord, for the Spirit of God who's able to deal with us during the preaching long after. God, you do what you need to do. And I pray, Lord, for a special blessing upon my brother Rick, upon Dennis, upon Marcy, and their need, Lord. I pray, God, you cover it. I pray the relationship would be sweeter than ever before. And, Lord, you'd give us some good fellowship. Helps to love one another with a pure heart. And God, keep your crowd safe as they travel. Lord, that there would not be any injuries, no accidents. Please, we ask it one more time in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. You're dismissed. Look for you at 7 tonight.